Well, welcome everyone to the 2022 Women's Association of Hilton Head Islands author series. I'm Robin Zimmerman, and I have been so pleased and honored to have served as your moderator for almost two years for the author series. This actually is our 21st webinar. So this is the March edition, and we have an author that is back with us, Marie Benedict. She is a New York Times bestselling author. And when she was with us in November, we discussed her book, which was a personal librarian. Her new book that just came out is called Her Hidden Genius. And I've got it right here. Let me hold it up by Marie Benedict. So we're really excited to have Janet interview her in just a moment. Do want to remind you this is a webinar, which means you can see us, but we cannot see you. So don't worry about what you're wearing or whatever, or how your hair looks. But uh, we love, because we have so many people that sign in, it's, we use the webinar um, uh, format instead of the, the uh, meeting format. But we definitely want to hear from you. We want you to be engaged with us. And so we have that chat button with, that you can make book recommendations, author recommendations for the future. If you have any questions that you might have for Marie Benedict, you can just go ahead and chat those in. And we also have uh, Nancy Fish who is our communications team chair, but she is also our technical guru. And she can certainly get that information to, um, and to Janet and to myself or whatever, if you're having some issues. But I'm really excited to bring in now Janet Porter, who is my colleague. We have worked together for the last two years. Janet always does a fantastic job on the interviews of our authors. So Janet, you look wonderful in your St. Patrick's Day green because your husband is an O'Sullivan. Is that right? James Michael Joseph O'Sullivan. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to wear green the whole month of March. It's, just, it's required in our family. <laughs> Top of the afternoon to you, my dear. <laughs> Thank you. So, Robin, you know, we, we, we keep track of how many people attend our webinars, but uh, we realized that when we did the Joy, Joy David's Joy, we did an event with Joy Baldridge. Some of you remember, maybe remember in February, and we had one Wahi member who brought together 18 women at her house to see Joy. Now, part of that is because Joy moved to Hilton Head in November, and she was. We had a great attendance. We had about 120 people at that mm -hmm. event that we knew of. But then, when when uh, when 18 sign in on one account, that's another 18 people that we weren't counting. But it got us thinking about recommending. Mm -hmm. To those of you who are who are watching today, who are kind of our groupies and and literary uh, you know frequent flyers, that you might think about doing a watch party for an upcoming uh, author event. Have people over, have drinks, talk about what you know what the author said afterwards, and whether your book group wants to read that. You can do that with your book group or just with friends. It's a great idea. And the women at the watch party that was <laughs> took place in Port Royal were having a great time in terms of the pictures. <laughs> and also, Jenna, Claudia Aller was on the member spotlight with Tamara Averett this past Monday. And there was a watch party for Claudia as well. Oh, was there? Yes, yes. They, I think it was a, a, another, maybe the same ladies or a whole other group. But that Port Royal group, they are but they are with it. they love getting together and watching authors and and fellow members so yeah it's a great idea so with that i'm going to turn everything over to you janet to introduce our guest thank you robin um before we get started i want to thank everyone who responded to the market survey we just conducted about the author series we are actually booked through may of 2022 which would be the end of our calendar year for Wahi with exciting authors. So we're booked monthly. But before we've planned for the upcoming Wahi year of 2022 to 23, we wanted to hear from our viewers about what they wanted. And we were so thrilled that 76 Wahi members responded to our survey. A lot of people responded to the survey who had registered but never attended. So we also heard from people who who um, had, had at, we, most of the people had attended and had comments, but some actually had registered but never been able to attend. So in response to your feedback, we're thrilled to be able to kick off our third season now of Wahi Author Series to share with you our local followers or groupies or frequent flyers, whatever you want to be known as, that in 2022, 23, we're going to continue to have the author series via Zoom. We heard loud and clear that you like it with Zoom. 
we are going to be changing to an every other month format from a monthly format to an every other month. But then we're also people, we also had people express interest in an in-person event. So in September, we're going to have a very special in-person event with a noted author. And we'll be sharing more of that to you, more about that, about location and date later on. But that'll be a big event that about 75 people will be able to attend. We'll probably have limited attendance. We'll do a book signing and it'll be uh, what we're, we're really looking forward to. It. Bobby Helbig is helping to plan that. So um, more to come on that. And please feel free to send us emails or just chat in now if you have any other suggestions. But we wanted to give you you'll hear more about this in the pink paper. So um, this is just a reminder, again, like Robin said, we want you to chat in or ask questions. And I, what I'll try to do is I'm, I'm watching the chat right now and I'll try to ask all your questions of Marie once she comes on. Um, I can't actually, sometimes because we had so many chats, I can't get to everybody's, but please let me know what you wanna hear from her. So I'm so excited to again, get the opportunity to talk with Marie Benedict about her latest book, Her Hidden Genius, which was just released on January 22nd. So probably, not all of you have had a chance to read it yet. So let me just tell you a little bit about Marie. If you're not familiar with her, you're probably familiar with her books, but um, she's actually graduated from law school and then spent 10 years as a litigator at two prominent national law firms before she realized that her real calling was to unearth the hidden historical stories of women. Her mission is to excavate from the past the most important, complex, and fascinating women of history and bring them into the light where we can appreciate their contributions as well as bring insight into modern day issues and the challenges they faced. This is actually her 14th novel, 14th novel. Many of her novels have been New York Times bestsellers, including Carnegie's Maid, The Mystery of Mrs. Christie, that's about Agatha Christie, and The Personal Librarian about J.P. Morgan's Personal Librarian. Marie's novels are so popular that they have been translated into 20, not 20 languages. So with that introduction, Marie, please join us. Hi, oh, Marie. It's so nice to be back with you, Janet, and it, your wonderful Wahi group. Yes, it's great to see you. So Marie, where are you right now? I am in Pittsburgh, which is where I live with my family. Um, you know, I love your area. I grew up, I think I told you this before, going to Hilton Head and Kew Island. So you guys are in my, one of my favorite stomping grounds. And I'm a little bit jealous that you're in some kind of nice balmy beachy weather. And I'm here in Pittsburgh in like the 40 degrees. We had like three inches of snow yesterday. So. Oh, did you? Oh no, we are so fortunate here. It, yes, it is. We are. We're going to have, we're going to have some uh, tricky weather this weekend, supposedly some storms, but it should be great. Um, so people are already, I already got a comment that they love the sunflowers in your room, Marie. Oh, thank you. You know, um, I have to say they were gifted to me. I, uh, this week I have, this is women's history month, which is like kind of my sweet spot, as you can imagine. Yeah. And, um, I think I'm doing like maybe eight events this week. And one of my hosts sent those, um, for us to show solidarity for what's happening in the Ukraine. Um, and so yeah. she, she had the sunflowers as well. And so it felt very meaningful. And I've chosen to leave them up there because they not only brighten the room, but, you know, just kind of keep our minds on some of the things that are happening around us. Yeah. You know, I'm from Kansas and the, the state flower of Kansas is a sunflower. I didn't and know. I, that. And I didn't know until um, the Ukraine situation, what a symbol that was of, of the Ukraine. Yeah, so um, until all of this happened. Yeah. And we said right before, I just had to tell this quick story because it's so <laughs> wonderful that we have our international piano competition going on this week. And there's a competitor from the Ukraine. One of the pianists is from the Ukraine. And this, the pianists all stay with local families. And the host of the local family for lives in Hilton Head Plantation of the Ukrainian um, pianist. And she asked her neighbors to put yellow and blue ribbons up and down the, the street and on their mailboxes in honor of the pianist. And when they went to the airport, the ribbons weren't out and they were all up and down the street. And when the pianist saw that level of support, he cried. Oh, that is so beautiful. Isn't and that a great story? Coming directly from the Ukraine or was or he? Directly from the Ukraine. Wow. There's a Ukrainian judge too. So 
Oh um, my gosh. Yeah. Well, that's a yeah. beautiful gesture of support. And isn't they that certainly wonderful? could use it right now. That's for yeah. sure. I was surprised he was able to get out. Get I was just thinking but, that. Like, did he, that's that why great? I said he fly directly, but I suppose, yeah. you know, there are ways to make that happen when, when you need to. Yeah. So we're going to be talking today about her hidden genius, which yeah. is the story of Rosalind Franklin, who was a noted scientist who got sort of uncelebrated, was sort of uncelebrated during her career. And Marie, I first became aware of her when I read The Code Breaker by oh, Walter yeah. Isaacson yeah. about Je Jennifer Doudna, who just recently won the Nobel Prize with her with her female partner from Europe. Um, um, and um, so, you know, tell us a little bit about Rosalind um, Franklin to start with and a little bit about how you became aware that she was a woman who should really be brought into the light as somebody who made very important scientific discoveries. Exactly. So, so as you mentioned, um, Rosalind Franklin was a brilliant British scientist, um, worked primarily in the 1940s and 50s, really post-World War II. Um, she came from uh, an affluent Anglo-Jewish family for whom service and philanthropy was super important. Um, she ultimately, um, through her hard work and this very sophisticated, time-consuming, meticulous technique called x-ray crystallography, she was able to discern the double helix structure of DNA. But without her knowledge or consent, that information was taken by one of her colleagues, Morris Wilkins, and shared with two gentlemen whose names are fairly well known, James Watson and Francis Crick, who won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of, um, of the structure of DNA. Now, I had a very high level understanding of her story. You know, I knew that she had made this discovery that she had in some way been marginalized or suppressed in terms of her contributions. Um, and she, I think last time I was here, I, I might've talked about this. I keep this really long, long list of historic women whose stories I want to tell, right? You know, I come across them in all different ways from family and friends, from readers. Um, I find them in research. I find them in newspaper articles everywhere. Um, and so she would kind of been on that list for a while, but I wasn't sure about her story. Um, first of all, I'm not a scientist. Uh, I'd say that I had to become one to write this book, but, um, if I can write this book, anyone can read this book, that's for sure. But I wasn't sure about really dedicating my research and writing to her until one of my very good friends called me. So I think I told you pretty much everyone in my orbit knows of my mission, is always kind of looking for these women. Um, and my friend is an ER doctor, and she's really a hero in her own right. She was in charge of the Red Cross in the New York metropolitan area during 9-11. She was one of the first responders, um, she and her team um, saved lots of people and uh, was really in there right from the beginning for weeks and weeks. Um, so when she called me and she said, okay, I have found the woman that you have to write about next, right? And people tell me that a lot, FYI, but she did. And I listened. She said, I just finished this incredible book called The Gene. It's a nonfiction book about sort of the history of genetics. And she said, there's a whole section of Rosalind Franklin there. And, and like me, she had a very general understanding of her. She said, there are two reasons why you have to tell her story. And I said, okay. And she said, number one, she made the ultimate sacrifice to make her discoveries. And I'm going to leave that at that because I don't want to give away too much of a spoiler. The second thing is that she's, to the extent that people know her, they know her for DNA, right? But in the years after her groundbreaking, really world-changing DNA discovery, she made these groundbreaking um, discoveries in the structure of RNA and viruses. She said, my friend said, that work is so important today as well. And I thought, okay, I'll take a deeper look. And, you know, her story turned out to be so engaging. I went, you know, towards it. And I wrote this book primarily during COVID. And during the lockdown, um, you know, during this time period when, you know, we, really we didn't know what was happening in our world. We really didn't understand COVID. As the news, as I, of course we were all glued to the news, I, it, I discovered that Rosalind Franklin's work in RNA and viruses was actually foundational to our modern day, modern day scientists understanding of COVID 
in the creation of vaccines, particularly RNA vaccines. So it was this unbelievable experience of having, you know, I always select women who have these important legacies. Her legacy was like growing and expanding before my eyes. It was unbelievable. So I am so grateful to my friend for making that phone call and saying, you know, you have to turn your attention to her because, you know, it was such a unique and rare experience to really watch a, one of my historical women's legacies exponentially grow before my eyes. So I have so many questions to ask you that from sure. what you just said. So let's start with your list. Okay. Oh, yeah. So what criteria do you use to figure out who to put at the top of the list? So for example, it's see, I've read almost all your books. I think I've read all of them and mm -hmm. not all 14 because I didn't, you write under the earlier name. ones. You yeah. write, you write under a different name. What's the other name you write under? Heather Terrell. So I haven't read the Heather Carroll books, but I've read all the Marie Benedict. And why did you write under a different last name? Well, my real name is Heather Marie Benedict Terrell. And my first seven books explored issues of untold pieces of history from different genres. So they were historical suspense. I did a series for young adults that really explores the way in which history is made. So it's very similar themes, but a very different genre. And I really feel like in many ways, those books were writing exercises to bring me to kind of my real calling, which is writing about these women. Um, and very often in the publishing world, when you shift genres, they like you to shift names. And so for me, I really felt like I couldn't just like pick a name out of a hat. I wanted to pick a name that that meant something to me that I would feel comfortable introducing myself as. So I just went with my middle name. So my real name is Heather Marie Benedict Terrell. Sorry, I was muted waiting for my husband to answer the phone. Um, um, <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I heard everything you said. No worries. Um, um, so, so you're well known as Marie Benedict based mm -hmm. on all these historical figures you've done. Yeah. Um, so you've got this list now mm -hmm. and yeah. how most of the women that you um, have written about have, there are diaries, there are letters, there's great mm -hmm. historical artifacts for you to use to create your fictionalized account of their list of their, of their story. That must be one criteria you use, but what other criteria you use to decide who gets moved to the top of the list? Well, the women don't even make it onto the list until unless they have two qualities. Um, the first is that they have a really significant, almost tangible legacy that has left left behind that we are beholden to, but we really don't know who's responsible. You know, a, a historic woman may have led an incredibly glamorous, fabulous life, but if, if there isn't something that we still, a contribution, something that she's made or discovered or, or founded that we really benefit from today, then she probably won't make the list. I, I'm very interested in the theme of way the, the way in which the past reverberates into the present. And so having that legacy is very important. The other is um, that the woman is grappling with some issue in her life that has modern day resonance. So for example, take, um, take Rosalind Franklin. Um, you know, that issue of female scientists being given opportunities, being given credit for their work, um, making sure they're not marginalized in the workplace, that unfortunately is still a very modern issue. So, you know, that, it, that would be one reason why Rosalind would have made my list. But how someone moves from just being on the list to the top, um, it's usually two things. First would have to be something about the, the their legacy or their issues is very timely right now, right? So in the case of say, the only woman in the room, which is about the actress Hedy Lamar and this invention that she made, when I learned that ultimately became Wi-Fi, um, and this was at a time period when Wi-Fi was exploding, I thought I absolutely have to tell her story. I mean, we're all using one of her inventions today and nobody even knows she's responsible for it. So that would kind of be an example of how someone who was on the list really might work their way up the list 
And also there might be issues within the story that really speak to me personally. For example, um, some of my women, not all of them, but some of them really struggle with the issue of um, they have careers and they have families. And how do they, how do they manage that work-life balance? You know, how do they make decisions um, to, to really support and be there for their families while at the same time pursuing careers? And if I'm in a particularly overwhelmed period in my life, that issue might appeal to me. And so I might move uh -huh. to the top of the list. So that, you know, they've really had to meet a lot of criteria to make their way on the list, but some of that, that decision to really focus in on them is, is some, something a little bit more ephemeral, something a little bit more um, speaking to the moment or speaking to me. Right. That's really interesting. And do you, do you, you seem to be producing a book a year is, mm -hmm. are you on a schedule to is that kind of your thinking? And do you have a calendar based on when you're going to have your draft done and when you're going to, oh. when you're going to do your research? Talk, talk about how that works. Yeah. So I, um, I have contracts to write a book year for the next five years, at least. Oh my gosh. Um, good for you. Good for you. You go. Yeah, girl. I'm, I'm very fortunate. Um, Though, and that's just my solo books, you know, Victoria and I have are working on other projects as well at the same time. So, you know, each year I generally, you know, a book is typically has to be delivered to your editor a year beforehand. So I'm researching and working on these books long before they hit the shelves um, that year before a book actually goes from your editor's hands into the bookstores a lot happens. And so while I might take that the year, I might two years before a book comes out, I'm writing it the year before the book comes out, I'm doing other things to, to either promote it, edit it, um, create, you know, reader's guides or writing articles about it, things like that. But at the same time, I might also be working on the next book that's coming down the pike. So at any given time, I have multiple books in different stages. Like right now, for example, Victoria and I are working on our co-written book, which comes out a year from this upcoming January, this upcoming June. I'm finalizing the copy edit for my book that comes out next January. And I'm working, I'm working on promoting two different books. So at any given time, it's kind of like they're all sort of spinning around. Right. So I have I to it. say, I have to tell you, Marie, we have not done a co-author interview. So I was anxious to see how the interview would go with you and Victoria. And we were blown away by your interview. You guys, you know, the conversation we had with you was very heartfelt. Mm -hmm. And um, it was so interesting to learn about your collaboration and the friendship that you've developed. It was so clear that you had developed um, a friendship that had really, um, enriched you as individuals oh absolutely and absolutely. I, and and if anybody i i just want to remind our readers that are those who are watching today that you can go to the wahi website and up in the right hand corner if you click on the little dots you can get to videos and we have videos of all of ours and if you don't watch anything else watch the marie benedict and victoria marie interview because we we it was your interview was very emotional yeah it, we have such, um, a bond. A, yeah. We have a really, really close bond and we talk about things very comfortably that are topics that are typically very uncomfortable for people. I mean, that's the nature of what we write. You know, we write, we write about issues of race and identity and, and uncomfortable things. And, um, that has forced us to really go deep within ourselves and go deep with each other. Um, and, and we just, I mean, I feel so fortunate that so many people have, were moved by the personal librarian and so fortunate that, um, you know, that we're writing other books together because we both just love it. It's, it's almost hard for us to write our own books now. <laughs> love you kind of, it's just me. Wait, I, I'm the only one spitting these plates. Um, but it, it gives us that opportunity to not only take the issues that we, developed and talked about and explored um, in the personal library and really take them to another level with our next book. Yes. And for those who don't know, the personal librarian is the story about a black woman, mm -hmm. Belle DaCosta Franklin, is that Green, Green, Green who, yeah. um, who uh, passes as white mm -hmm. 
And so she's in the early, tw in the tw 1920s, she's a young woman who's traveling the world representing J.P. Morgan, passing for white. And you determined that if you were going to really write her story, you needed to collaborate with somebody who would better understand what that was like. And that's how you make mm -hmm. met Victoria. But it was clear, it was almost like um, the story behind the story of writing the book, Marie, was yes. as interesting as the story. Oh, thank you. I mean, for us, it is obviously. <laughs> Us. But, you know, for us to, to have written that book during COVID or add that one, we edited during COVID, but it was a lot of, of writing as well. While so many racial um, things were happening in our country really brought, brought the past into the present in a, an extremely powerful way um, and created really a bond between us that, um, that, that is really very unique and special. It well, really the interesting is. thing is that you started that collaboration before the George Floyd incident, oh, before yeah. the George Floyd murder. And so you were collaborating before that, and that really brought to the forefront you and she having really intimate conversations about race. And um, uh, so it, it, it's, it was almost prophetic that you picked mm -hmm. her as a topic. And that it came oh, out when God. it did. Yeah, really, really timely. Hey, I want to get back to something you sure. said. Um, Marie, my goddaughter yeah. is getting a PhD in biochemistry at UCLA. Oh my gosh. And, and she graduates with her PhD in um, May, in the end of May. And she interviewed with five companies, five drug companies. She wants to make breakthrough pharmaceuticals. Oh, and she got amazing. four offers. And most of the women in at UCLA in biochemistry the, right now are women. Most of the oh do do doctoral candidates. And you, she was so excited I was interviewing you because of course, Rosalind Franklin is right up there with Jennifer Doudna in terms of yeah. major heroines of them. So are you finding, particularly not just during Women's History Month, but are you finding that a lot of women in science are reaching out to you to oh, yeah. uh, have you, I would imagine you'd be a very popular speaker at a STEM conference or something. Are, Actually, is that what's just, happening? Just, yes. Just today I did an event for the American Women in Science. No, the Association for Women in Science. It's an international organization that represents women in all different scientific fields. So, you know, for a lot of these women, they, like your goddaughter, they knew the story of Rosalind Franklin. They knew that she, you know, she really, up against all odds, became this, this scientific wonder right and made this incredible discovery and yet was marginalized they knew her story they knew they know the nature of her contributions but the the lar larger broader world doesn't and so for them to to realize that one of their heroines somebody who's really um really led the way for them in many ways um is becoming much more widely known has been very impactful and, and more than that too, I get a lot of people reaching out to me individually who've read the book, a lot of scientists um, who just see see a lot of themselves in it. I mean, it heartens me to hear that there are so many women in, in your goddaughter's doctoral program and that you know she's having so many opportunities. I think a lot of the change that has come has come very recently, but I think there's women who've gone you know, through some of these programs or in the, in the work field 10, 20 years ago where it wasn't quite as welcoming and they could really identify with um the sorts of things that Rosalind went through as she all she wanted to do was do her science right yeah, yeah. and um and and her frustrations and and they're really excited about the opportunity to claim her and celebrate her and her legacy in in a much more broad way than they have in the past so you didn't say this when you were going through your criteria but all the women that you've gone through that I've seen you feature in your books um, have gone through incredible obstacles because they were women. And we know that women were discriminated against in all professions, but were you still surprised by the challenges that Rosalind Franklin faced in, in science? Um, I know you expected her to have gone through obstacles, but were you surprised by the way she was treated and the obstacles she encountered from her diaries and books that you read? I, yes, because I think, you know, she had this experience she had working in the lab where she discovered the structure of DNA was sandwiched between 
two positive scientific scientific institution experiences, right? You know, yes, there were some marginalization of women, but it was uh, it was on a much smaller scale. What she experienced at King's College, where she worked on DNA, was so egregious. Um, this relationship she had with Morris Wilkins, who, um, just to back up a second, so she, as you know, she was hired to use this very specialized technique that she learned, x-ray crystallography, which basically allows, or still does, but did at that time, allow scientists to see the micro universe of structures, at, uh, both on the atomic and molecular level. Um, and she, um, she was hired, she thought initially to look at proteins. Right before she started, that changed, and she was um, the, the topic matter was for her examination of DNA. Now, little did she know when she got to the lab at King's College that the head of her unit had taken DNA away from Morris Wilkins and given it to her, but nobody had told Morris Wilkins. And so it set up this acrimonious, difficult dynamic from the very, very start which of course had nothing to do with Rosalind. It wasn't her fault. It was mismanagement on the head of the lab, mismanagement on Morris Wilkins' part because he had had DNA for a while and hadn't been able to come up with anything. Um, and then it sort of devolved from there. His treatment of her, the way in which um, he talked about her at conferences to Watson and Crick, um, and the way ultimately in which he felt perfectly justified in taking her hard work her years of work and sharing it with other people who then, you know, Watson and Crick took all of her data. And within six weeks, they built a model and wrote a paper that won them the Nobel prize. They could have never done it without all, all her work. And he had no problem, no compunction doing that. So watching that happen was just, it, it was like gobsmacking. It was so, it, if you, if there's black and white and gray, like this is, I don't even know what it's so out, outside the bounds of what would be acceptable to anyone. And so I think that barricade, that hurdle was, was really shocking to me. It really was. Now, the other thing that was interesting about it is that of course the dynamic wasn't started by Rosalind, but Rosalind was a hard worker, very methodical. As a woman, she knew she had to do everything perfectly or no one was going to take her groundbreaking research seriously. Um, and she was serious, you know, she, she wasn't dour, but when she was in the workplace, she was like nose to the grindstone and that quality was being used against her. One of the reasons that Morris Wilkins found her so frustrating is because she just wouldn't go ahead and publish the initial findings and win this prize for her, yeah. for her lab, even though that's not what a, you know, a reasonable scientist would do. He would have never dared ask a man to do that. So there's all these layers and, and sort of interesting decisions along the way to unpack, but absolutely the hurdle that she had to surmount um, in, in working and staying in that lab and doing the incredible work that she did was really unbelievable. But to her credit, afterwards, she rose above it all. She took her skills, she took her brilliance, at took it to a different lab and made equally incredible discoveries, right? And that was one of the things that I've done in this book that I've, I've heard a lot of scientists and just readers say that they really appreciate it is that, you know, Rosalind Franklin was not a one hit wonder. She, she had these other things that she discovered and found and did, which are every, almost every bit as important. And to celebrate that, to celebrate the way in which she rose above this horrible situation and obstacle to really soar and fly and create not just um, scientific discoveries, but to create this wonderful work dynamic that she had there that she was in charge of um, was really heartening for, um, for people, I think. Well, it is terrific that through works like yours and other books that have been published, like the Gene and other books, that um, she's getting credit now in terms of buildings being named for her and things like that, yeah. that where people are appreciating what a groundbreaking pioneering scientist she was. And, you know, I'm sure I'm not the only person listening today who has a granddaughter or a niece mm -hmm. or a goddaughter who's in science. And yes. um, I, I think uh, people may be a little intimidated by reading a book about a female scientist, but you do a great job humanizing her. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a great book to give to that niece or, or granddaughter 
to inspire them to, you know, hang in there because she was, she was really a testament to grit and fortitude. Absolutely. You know? That's such a great way to put it. I mean, her, not just brilliance, but her resilience and tenacity were off the charts. Amazing. And, you know, it's interesting. You talk about, about the, the humanity of her. I've been very fortunate with this book that I've um, come to know um, some of her fam Rosalind's family, including her namesake, her niece, who's also named Rosalind Franklin. Um, in fact, I just did an event with her um, for the Rosalind Franklin university, which is a medical school yesterday. And one of the things that she told me that the family really appreciates is to the extent that people know Rosalind, they think of her as, you know, the scorned scientist of DNA, but she said, your book for the first time humanizes her, tells a love story, tells a story of determination, tells the story of a woman who's not just bright, but a wonderful friend, a woman who's not only an adventurer in science, but an adventurer in the world. She was like a world-class hiker and did, did all sorts of incredible things. So it brings her to life, I hope, in a very, even though it's fiction, very real way and, um, and celebrates her as a person and not just as a scientist as well. So talk about Ross and Franklin Medical School. Oh yeah, so that... Actually, there's so many things that have been named after Rosalind Franklin, you wouldn't believe it. There's um, the Rosalind Franklin Medical School, which is um, in Illinois. Um, it was a pre-existing medical school, and they just felt so inspired by her and her work um, and that they named their university after her with, with the family's permission, of course. There, there's a Mars rover named the Rosalind Franklin. There's the Rosalind Franklin Institute, which is this huge cutting edge research facility in, um, in England. Um, and there's lots of smaller things, but you know, that kind of goes back to the point that in the science world, she's known, but she's a woman to whom we are all beholden, but we really don't know her or really don't understand the scope of her contributions and, and really the humanity of her work as well. So we hope, I'm, 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 I think I asked you this in November and you didn't tell me, but I, I, I expect you don't want to tell me who, what your, who your next book features. Are you, can oh, you really say that now? Oh, can you tell yeah. us? Okay. Who's yeah. your next, tell us about your next book. Okay. So my next book comes out next January. It's called The Mitford Affair. Um, you may or may not be familiar with um, the six Mitford sisters. Which I am. Were, okay, good. Um, so those were the, like the it girls of the English aristocracy in the 1920s and 30s. So they were the, this, this was the Kardashians of the, of that era. The, exactly. This was the they, but they were actually royalty, right? So a little bit different, but, but not, otherwise not too different. Um, each one was more beautiful, more eccentric, more gifted than the next, um, always in the social news, et cetera. Um, as we got into the 1930s and um, the war was approaching in Europe and we really, you know, are facing a battle between fascism and Nazism and socialism um, and the communism as well, um, two of the sisters, Unity and Diana, become enamored with fascism. Uh, mm -hmm. One sister leaves her Guinness, that's a nod to the Irish there for you, Janet, her Guinness heir husband for Oswald Mosley, who's the head of the British fascists and unity uh, following in her sister's footsteps and then taking it to another level moves to Munich and becomes um, a very close companion, if not mistress of Hitler. As the years progress, one of the sisters, Nancy Mitford, who becomes a famous novelist in the years after the war, um, begins to suspect that her sisters are much more than just obsessed with fascists. She begins to suspect that her sisters are plotting against their country. And in a way, it becomes not just a typical profile of a woman, but it becomes a spy story. The story of one sister's choice between loyalty to her country and loyalty to family, um, and the way in which seemingly typical people become can become wrapped up in the sway of some of these very extreme political movements and how that can affect a family as well. So, Marie, I have read about the Midfords and their story is intriguing and I'm so glad to, I, I'm sure you will humanize their story too. Yeah. I just, I can't <laughs> tell you and I can't tell you how much we appreciate that you're bringing heroines to light for us. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, we always love hearing from you. So thank you very much. Thank you. It's such a pleasure. And I sign off now, right? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. For, thank you all for having me. <laughs> Enjoy your beautiful weather. And now what I'd like to do is welcome Claudia Ayler, who uh, will be discussing our WAHI events, our upcoming WAHI events. Claudia? Wow, that was terrific, Janet. That was just a fantastic author. And um, I'm going to talk about two events, but I also want to um, point out that we have a, an interest group that's being started by Nancy Contel called Coming Life Science Revolution. And it's based on a, a, like a, a book discussion group with women who have a science background in Wahi and want to talk about climate change and gene editing. And uh, she based her title on Walter Isaacson's book, Codebreakers. So watch for that. Nancy's got a, a few women uh, already joined, but we're going to publicize it again this week in the pink paper. So if you're interested in those kind of topics and you want to carry it forward into a group discussion, um, email Nancy for more information. Thank you, Claudia, uh, for telling me cool. that. Um, a couple of things to, coming up, a couple of wonderful things. We're starting to get a, a crowd at our events. We have a, a St. Patrick's Day fundraiser coming up next week. It's sold out. Um, but it's going to be a lot of fun and it's going to raise funds for our youth service awards. Um, after that, we've got um, a member spotlight for um, focusing on Jane McAuliffe. And then in late May or late March, uh, we still have two seats left for uh, the Lean Ensemble Theater's presentation of Doubt. So we're going to have a special viewing as uh, a WAHI member and a special uh, talk before the play from the executive director. So if you're a theater lover, uh, there's still a couple seats left for that matinee. Um, next, we head into a fantastic, um, what I would call a double header um, of, of exciting events. We've got our April 7th luncheon at the Marriott. Please make sure to sign up for that luncheon. We're gonna be uh, celebrating resilience through the history of Hilton Head. And as Janet said earlier, we are thrilled to have Carolyn Grant, who's a co-author of Gullah Days on Hilton Head Island before the bridge. We'll also be recognizing uh, students, uh, our student recipients of the Youth Service Awards. So please join us on April 7th. The day before on April 6th, our Difference Makers is going to be a, doing a huge food drive in the parking lot of the Sea Turtle, um, sea turtle uh, Shopping Center. We did this last year. We were able to um, donate 2,000 pounds of canned goods and food. This year, we're hoping to top that and break that record. And we know that uh, Second Helpings and the folks on Hilton Head uh, with all that's going on with gas prices and in the world right now, we could really help a lot of our neighbors in the community by uh, by bringing some food over to the Sea Turtle parking lot that day. So think about April 6th and April 7th. Uh, always look at the events calendar. We, we always have um, great new things to do that come out every day, and we want to make sure that that you, you get an opportunity to take advantage of them. And that's all I've got, um, Janet and uh, Robin. I will turn it back over to you. Hey, Claudia, great job. <laughs> A lot going on. I've really enjoyed working with you this year's president-elect in publicity. And Janet, of course, did a super job with the interview of Marie Benedict. Her book, again, is Her Hidden Genius. Here it is. And when we have these offered authors on our author series, it's, it's so important to read their books and go out and buy them to support them. We want to thank Bobby Helbig, Nancy Fish, the whole team that does our author series. This is our 21st edition. We'll see you next month in April. The date is April the 14th, and it is a debut author, Michael Almond, The Tannery. So we hope you, that is Heritage Week, but we hope that you'll, you will join us for our 22nd webinar author series for the 2022 series uh, for our authors for Women's Association of Hilton Head Island. Everyone have a nice weekend. I know the weather's going to be a little chilly on Sunday, but enjoy. And thank you so much for joining us. And we'll see you in April. Bye, everyone.